I'm Darlene Harmon, and welcome to the show. Esther Gokhale's interest in healing began in India, where she assisted her mother, a nurse, in treating babies waiting to be adopted. Her own history with back trouble led her to study and research in many countries, which culminated with this book, Eight Steps to a Pain-Free Back. The Gokhale method has expanded, and teachers worldwide now teach the techniques. One of the teachers is Manisha White, Esther's youngest daughter, and she's here today. She also is a national and world champion in Ultimate Frisbee. Hey, welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. Wonderful to Thank be here. You. I love your book. It's full of everyday practices that people do without even thinking about it. Sleeping, sitting, walking, bending, and much more. What would you consider to be some of the most important things in this book? I think the most important thing is to lengthen and reshape the spine, to be more like a modern J okay. instead of what conventional wisdom has as normal, which is S. Okay. And so we're trying to help people get back to the shape of the spine that you see in indigenous people like these Ubang tribesmen. And you see the same J spine in ancestral populations and also in every kid on the planet. <laughs> as you, and if you go back in older anatomy books, then you see illustrations that show this J spine as opposed to an S spine. Um, and so what I'm trying to do is get people back to that J spine. And on this picture of the two spines, you can see how different that is. Um, so we have, we have uh, pictures up, uh, of the spines yeah. coming up. There we are. And so I've come a long way in my own body in starting with something close to that S spine. And you can see that in my MRI from many, many moons ago. And the MRI shows an uh, exaggerated curve in my lumbar area. Wow. And you can see at L5, S1, that there's a large herniation, and this did not feel wonderful. This, this was like is an in the ice lower pick in portion? The back. Yeah, there's uh -huh. a little, there's a big bump sticking yes. out of that yes. um, L5-S1 disc. Okay. And to show you how far I've come from that shape, what I've done is stuck, our latest invention is a set of sensors, and I've got them stuck to my back here, and they are communicating with my iPhone app. And you can see on this app that it follows the shape of my spine, but when I sit that I have something much closer to the J than an S. And that used to be, I used to be shaped more like this, wow. okay? Oh. And to give you an idea of what that looks like on the inside of me, we have another view on this app. So I can switch to this, and here you can see that you know, all the tissues are looking quite happy. But if I go back to what I used to be doing at baseline, all, this was how I used to be all the time. Ta-da, you know, yes. gymnastics gone wrong. Yeah. And <laughs> I had to train myself to elongate my back. Um, and I'd like to demonstrate. I'd love to see Stretch it. sitting. <laughs> yeah. So Manisha and I are going to go and work with those chairs there. And the chair needs to have some kind of friction element in the back. So that could be sewed into the back. It could be part of a cushion pad added to the back like you see here. Or it could be a simple towel that you just, if it's a fabric chair, that will work fine. So let's demo with Manisha. You're going to sit there. Did I get this one? Yeah. <laughs> and you're going to put your bum back in the chair. And then she's going to come forward. So this is what you want to do. Hinge away from whatever friction element, whether it's a cushion or a towel. And now you're going to elongate your back by curving forward first. And then using the hands to push the top away from the bottom. Make yourself extra tall. Hook to whatever it is that you have back there that's going to hold you. And now you are a little taller than um, if you were just sitting against the back. So I'm going to demonstrate this too. 
So if I go back and I now elongate my spine, now I've got my back all stretched out. And this was how I made my changes initially in my back. Amazing. And so you actually designed this chair? Yes. And the cushion and all kinds of implements to help people learn and to support good posture. That's, so, but, so how did you do this? Did you study uh, your back? And was it like a logical thing that you knew what you need? This is amazing, you know, that you knew what you needed to do. Well, what's really cool to me is that it actually works as well as it does, you know. Mm. So I studied other techniques. I studied aplomb, French technique, and then I also looked at the medical literature, and I traveled, and I took videotapes, and, and bit by bit crafted a pathway that is very logically based. And the bottom line is that it just gives amazing results. Mm. Well, your book goes into a lot of detail about the different cultures. And there's so many that I really liked and it's been helpful to me. Um, bending, especially for gardening. I had no idea that, you know, you're supposed to st stick your tush out a little bit. You know, I thought you had to tuck it in and stuff like that. So I had to learn a lot about that. Uh, you've had a lot of studies done that support your we've, posture technique. What are they? We've done some. So we have slide of um, an in-house study we did where we interviewed people at the beginning of the study, at the, uh, at the beginning of the, our course, end of the course, and then four weeks out. And you can see the results here. Like people, you know, really have a lot of improvement from the beginning to the end of the course. And then four weeks later from having practice, they continue to improve. That was very gratifying to see. And then there is also a website that is a crowdsourcing website. And here they are comparing 45 different techniques for lower back pain. And ours is, by a very large margin, the number one rated um, approach for lower back pain. And you know, this, is, this, this study includes 155,000 reviews. It's wow. really cool. Stanford did a study on it. So we're very proud that we're rating that high. And that is what we really work hard towards, like results. Mm. And of course, the people that you come in contact with, I guess you get a lot of people saying how much has helped them. Um, yeah. yeah. So do you actually take like before and after pictures of people? Always. <laughs> <laughs> we do it of sitting, standing, bending, and we have a large collection of these, yes. Mm. And in even a fairly short time, you see pretty dramatic changes in people's mm. postures and structures. Well, I think a lot of it is just being aware. Um, and I have to say that I remember you saying um, years ago when you were on my show on another station, and you mentioned, I, um, I said, well, that would be hard, you know, it's a sleeping thing. You were demonstrating a sleeping uh, position. And I said, well, I'd be waking myself up all the time in order to maintain that position. And you told me, you said, five minutes. If you can maintain that five, five minutes, then you go back to your regular sleeping. And you said to me that that would be helpful. And I think that that's true because Five minutes is about all I can handle. But um, it, it gets your, what, your brain working that tells you, you know, reinforce, what, what's happening there? Your brain Well, you is... just become comfortable and your muscles are resetting to a longer resting length. So no matter what other position you then move to, you're still a little longer and more comfortable. Your discs have more room and so on. So hmm. yeah. but people are often surprised. So we tell them, do it just five minutes. And if you need, go to any other position. And it's not rare that people come back saying, that was the first time I fell asleep and woke up in the same position I went to sleep in in oh, a long time. Really? So a <laughs> lot of people experience pretty quickly, actually, in having a more elongated, healthy alignment. They end up sleeping better and more comfortably quite quickly. And this thing about getting taller, I mean, have you actually done measurements? On yes. Really? We used to measure people at the beginning and end of our once a week for six weeks course. And the average height increase was between half and two thirds of an inch. And we're talking 60, 70, 50 year olds. Yeah. It's very because, cool. see, that's the thing is when you get older, they say you shrink. Ha! 
So you, you don't have, doesn't to. have to be. <laughs> <laughs> I don't yeah. plan on shrinking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's what they say is that you shrink. And so wouldn't it be nice if you didn't shrink? Yeah, and I don't I, think and, she'll shrink. Well, I, I think it happens so gradually in most cases, maybe not all. But in, in a lot of cases, I think it's a gradual thing, and people just aren't really aware of it. You know, I think. A lot of people start getting a little bit more and more compressed. And one of the core fundamental pieces of uh, healthy posture is maintaining length in the context of your everyday life. And if you are using techniques like stretch sitting and stretch lying that are actually adding traction and length into your everyday life, then you maintain height. Or if you've lost some height, you can actually gain it back rather than Really? You can gain it back? Yeah. No, I didn't know that. <laughs> well, that's, that's good to know. <laughs> so you've actually passed on uh, these techniques of uh, practicing good, healthy posture and movements, and you've passed them on to your children. So we have Anisha here, but you have other children as you have two others, right? Yes. Two other children? Yes. Okay. And so, Manisha, what do you remember about growing up and regarding posture and how you were trained? I was really lucky in being raised with my posture mostly intact. Uh, <laughs> and most of the guidance and, uh, you know, and support in my posture came from before I even remember. Uh, bef you know, when I was a baby, you can see actually uh, the next picture you bring up is an image of me being <laughs> carried. Uh, on the back by my ah, sister. So my mother used to carry me on <laughs> her back uh, with this uh, cloth wrap. Um, that's the way they do it in village Africa. And she taught my sister how to carry me this way as well. And as I'm being carried this way, my back is being elongated and kept in a nice tall alignment. Um, and as she set me up in, a, in the next slide shows me sitting, being sat up in a tub. Uh, and I'm being bolstered with pillows and blankets, and this is, you know, and I might not have been able to support myself, but I'm being supported with a tall, elongated spine, uh, so my shape is preserved. Uh, and so I learned. You can see that in the next slide, how nice the shape is from this technique. <laughs> <laughs> That's adorable. <laughs> Very nice. And unfortunately, you know, a lot of people, um, if you go into the next slide, uh, if we look at the next photo, you oh. see how a lot of people in our culture are carried as babies. This is how a lot of babies I in our culture. I have seen this a lot. And kids spend a lot of their time now, in Now, what these is the positions. fault? Is it the seat itself? Yes. The seat. Yes. So this, you know, the, this car seat and also a lot of strollers, including umbrella strollers, are essentially molding They're babies. They're nothing. They're just a sling, kind and of a the sling. C shape. Yes. And then they carry it forward into their childhood. So in the next slide, you'll see what happens to a baby who's been carried that way. Wow. They just have this pattern, this neural pattern. Um, and this is what their subroutine for sitting says. So um, this is not ideal. No. But they're probably not even aware of it. No. That picture, that first one, when you were carrying Monisha, <laughs> I noticed that your back was um, tilted, but perfectly straight. Yeah, like, you know, in the next slide, we can actually see um, how we're patterning, how, what, what the result of this is. You know, this is her neighbor, her best friend. So Manisha's on the right in mm. the pink shirt, sitting, you know, this is, this is her pattern of sitting. Yes. And then, you know, her best friend has this other memory of sitting. So you see a very sharp contrast. And this is before I had actually trained officially in posture. I, you know, I, I eventually went on to take our course and to train as a teacher. But at this point, this was before I had formally learned. Um, but by, you know, the way I was carried and gentle hands-on guidance, I learned this shape. Your and friend. you can also learn movement yeah. that way, other positions in the next slide. Wait Maybe. a minute. Yeah. Your friend, yeah. though, looking at that, just looking at the rear end, uh -huh. <clears throat> it's very tucked in. Yes. That's not right. No. You it, want your behind behind. It's called a behind for a reason. It needs to be out behind. Yes. yes. And that supports you. Yes. And yet a lot of um, fashions, and as you, especially as you get older and you get self-conscious of your body yeah. and so forth, and some of the, the fashions and so forth and the way they're taught, and they're just not 
they're not like straight and sticking out the way it should be. They're tucked in. That yes. isn't right. And I it's think a big problem. Yes, and I think uh, as well as some professional training too. Yes, True. like ballet and things like that. Sometimes. True. Sometimes. Yeah. It's really unfortunate. Even hmm. a lot in a lot of the yeah even in a lot of the health world, there's a lot of um, guidance in sitting in what we consider to be problematic postures, um, yes. like tucking the bottom underneath rather than having it naturally out behind the way you well, see Well, you it. can see very naturally. That's what I like about this picture. It's, it's very obvious right here. You, you, it might not be obvious, you know, if you're just looking by itself, but when you can see, you know, not just the spine, but you can see the total posture is not ideal. Your legs seem to be pretty much the same. Um, mm -hmm. I noticed your head, though, is quite nice. It's <laughs> <laughs> quite up there. <laughs> and it was not just positions that, you know, that I was raised in doing well. If you go to the next slide, um, you'll also see that uh, here's me being, you know, bending while I'm sitting in a tub. And the way I'm being guided is, uh, is that I'm being guided to bend or hinge at the hips and the rest of my spine is kept really nice and straight. And so this is patterning in a really healthy bending technique. In our culture, you tend to see people rounding the spine. Uh, and here I'm starting to learn a healthy technique of actually hinging at the hips. And in the next slide, you see me uh, a little bit older, now able to do it on my own while standing, and I'm using the same shape. How old are you there? About mm, three? Yeah, you know better younger, than I do. Younger. Younger. <laughs> and then Two, you see three. her in, uh, in the next slides, you see her as an athlete and how she carried these movement well, tell us about wisdom. that. You know, what did you start out with? I, I understand it was just like from day one, you just were drawn to be an athlete. So what did you start out with and how did the posture morph into that? Soccer was my biggest sport from early on. I played soccer for about, for over 10 years, mm. uh, 10 to 12 years. Most wow. of that time was as a goalie. On the next, on this picture, you can see a few images of me and my soccer career, starting very young, as you can see. <laughs> Um, and being an athlete has always been a really big and important part of my identity. And having been raised with my posture intact and raised with healthy movement patterns translated very naturally and automatically into good form as an athlete. And unfortunately, you know, a lot of people are not trained in good form uh, in athletics and their sport until uh, later on in their career until they get to higher, more competitive le levels. But at that point, a lot of your movement patterns have already been developed. And so you can see, you know, on the lower right, I'm, um, I'm diving for, for a ball, but I'm actually hinging at the hips. Uh, in the, and your knees are bent. And my knees, yeah, my yes. knees are a little bent and they're yes. nicely externally rotated. Uh -huh. um, I played for a long time. I played ultimate frisbee after soccer. I went on to um, play ultimate frisbee in this next slide. So soccer you'll see. and ultimate frisbee, some, something else was in between, right? A lot of sports. I played a little bit of volleyball. I played some basketball. I played, um, I played a number of sports throughout my time, but soccer and ultimate frisbee were the, That's... were the main two. So in the, in the next picture or in the next um, image, you'll see me playing ultimate frisbee. And again, you can see on here on the left is me throwing a frisbee and my shoulders are really well down. My chest is open. My neck is tall. And I didn't have to learn when I went to playing frisbee uh, to have my shoulder in a healthy position. It defaulted to already being back. Um, so it already put me in a position of mechanical advantage. Hmm. And in extreme positions, like you see on the next slide. Next is yeah, Nathan actually Nathan. also got patterned this way. And Nathan is your son. <laughs> yeah, he's my middle child. Mm -hmm. And he's very tall. He's six foot five. Wow. And Though the very tall frisbee players, especially when they do layouts, tend to get in trouble with their backs, and he hasn't had any problem whatsoever. Mm. And I, we do think that it has a lot to do with his baseline posture, which again, you can see in this slide, how his legs are well aligned, his knees <laughs> facing the same way that his foot is facing. He's mm. hinging from his hips with a very straight back. His shoulders are very open and back. It gives him a lot of reach. Um, wingspan, they call it. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. so, you know, it helps in multiple ways in sports to have good posture. Um, the next slide, 
shows oh, Manisha wow. doing a layout. <laughs> and so you can see how extreme these positions and movements can, how demanding they can be. And so and there's- In the heat of the moment, you're not gonna be able to be thinking about what my form is, how each body position is gonna be aligned. Yeah. Um, in the heat of the moment, you do what you default to doing, what movement patterns have become habitual. Mm -hmm. So it's lucky for me that I've been habitually um, keeping my shoulders in healthy alignment rather than being rounded forward. My behind it is naturally to me behind like you're me. You're falling and trying to recover yourself a little bit. I mean, so that I'm, position is unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is me catching a frisbee to, but right before it touches the ground. So that's when you usually lay out or dive is to keep keep possession possession of the frisbee. Let's back up a little bit and talk just a little bit about what ultimate frisbee is. I'm sorry, I'm at the level where you throw it to your dog or you see it at the beach and the kids are playing. What is ultimate frisbee? Ultimate frisbee is a team sport. It's a little like a combination of basketball, basketball. American football, and soccer. I'm having trouble. <laughs> <laughs> there are two end zones. Okay. And at the beginning of the point, each team lines up on the front of their end zone. There's seven people on each team on the field at a time. The, offending, the defending team throws or pulls the Frisbee to the other side, and then they go play defense. The offending team now has to throw the Frisbee between team members to make their way up the field, and you score a point by throwing it to somebody who catches it in the end zone. Well, those I did a basic. little research on uh -huh. it, and the part that I liked was that there's no referee. You're like self-monitoring yourself. How does that work? It's I love this. You know, <laughs> that was so happy when all three kids went into frisbee because the culture is so healthy. You know, you're accountable. You know, yeah. there you don't you don't you're not pushing for unfair advantage. Um, Ultimate Frisbee is self ref and that means you make calls on the field, and there's a lot of rules in place so that you can't just abuse it, but, uh, you know, one person might call a foul, and the other person can either, the other team can either contest, or they can agree, and something different happens whether they agree or don't agree, um, but everything is discussed on the field, so if you call a foul and they disagree, <laughs> then you talk it out, oh, and uh, you quickly. And that could take a half an hour. No, no, no. <laughs> We wouldn't let that happen. Um, no, I read where if they disagree, then it goes back to the person who had it before, the last hit, yeah. or whatever you call it. A lot of nuances to the rule. Oh. Yeah. And, but yeah, in general, if someone, if there's a foul called and the other person contests, then the Frisbee will go back. Oh, here's something you like, Darlene. <laughs> like at Stanford, when she was on, she was co-captain of the Stanford women's team. And so we would go and watch. And whenever, at the end of every game, they have alter, like one person from team A, next person team B, team A, team B, all arm in arm like that. And then they admire each other, you know, for <laughs> special things. They call out what they liked about the opposite team. And they also, Stanford had it's a It's called really the Spirit nice Circle. Thing. Spirit oh, Circle. Oh, I did read that. And Spirit I thought that of the was game. Awesome. Spirit of the mm. game is actually written into the rules of Ultimate. It's, um. We have a few <laughs> minutes left. I wanted to ask you if there's anything else you could show us maybe about stance or anything in sports that would be helpful to anybody? Yeah, there's a common stance to most sports. I think of it as a ready position uh -huh. where you're a little bit, um, where your muscles are prepped to work. You're not just parked in your joints. You know, you're a little <laughs> bit like bent forward. It's a hip yeah. hinge. And you're going to run. She's getting ready to run. So it's in, in sprinting or in running. You know, yes. the starting position is a little modified version of that, the starting position in sprinting. Volleyball would be very low. Tennis would be uh, not quite as low. In American um, football, you see really nice hip hinging form way. in the context of this ready position. If you look at American football, it's, it's rare that you see really rounded spines. Generally, hmm. you see really nice preserved s spines. Um, so this position is where you have a little bend in or give at the knees, but then you hinge from the hips and that's the only piece that moves is your pelvis rotating over your femur and your spine stays totally intact. Your shoulders stay back, your neck stays back, your sh sh spine shape doesn't move. You see this in lifting, in weightlifting, you tend to see really good hip hinging One form. of the nuances in this position is that the legs need to be externally rotated. They can't, the femurs, the thigh bone, the, can't be in the way of the pelvis. They so have to be wait, out of the wait, way. You're saying the knees have to turn out. out. Yes. Okay. 
Yes. Rather than being turned in. Right. And, and that's not good for your knees either, to be no. turned in, right? Correct. That's like, okay, so your knees should be out and, and your feet should, well, hopefully your All feet facing are... facing the same way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's very, very important. And do you ever coach teams? Do they ever ask you to go around and coach teams? Yeah, I've, uh, I've thought about, I have been asked to coach a, a couple of teams, and I've been busy and haven't, haven't committed to coaching a team yet, but I, would, I see myself coaching in the future. I certainly could see that because you were saying that they really do not get that kind of training. Now, why football has it, maybe it's the stuff that they wear, but, you know, why they seem to know how to be in a position, a good position, and you say others do not. So, um, you know, it's like, um, uh, how do they know in football to be in a good position and others that they, do don't, they don't? I think they it's don't a the tradition. Training. The tradition. sport was invented a very long, long time ago when they knew how to bend, when people knew how to bend. And also the downside of being out of good position in football is far more severe. Like if you're going to ram yourself into something the size of a refrigerator, <laughs> you better have good form at the very least. Yes, that's yeah. true. Survival. And you see imperfections, and you tend to see in the higher levels of sports, in a lot of sports, you actually see better form because you don't get to the higher levels without good form because you get injured. Yeah. 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 Yeah, good form makes such a difference not only in performance, but also preventing injury and healing faster if there is an injury. Ah. Well, I've just really, really enjoyed having you both on. And, um, and I'm, I'm going to reread and study this book. I mean, I read it nine years ago, and I think I've been slipping, so I need to go back, because it's really important for people to know that, um, like what you covered, five minutes, just five minutes, try a, a position that is supposed to be right, and see if it sticks, and if it doesn't, try it again. Um, check the website for details. You can check about uh, workshops and uh, information we talked about here. I especially like the uh, blogs and the videos. Very, very helpful. So thanks for watching the show, and please watch again. And Esther, would you mind signing my book? <laughs>